Good evening, folks. Sorry for the slight delay there. A couple of little technical things and me not being entirely prepared. How are we all doing? I'm hoping the sound's coming through okay. I'll wait for the uh, shout from chat to see if that's all good and then we'll dive in. Today we're going to be um, doing another kind of long form lesson in the uh, style of the little bits of Lisp. Um, and. Um, Sorry, I just saw an interesting thing come up in chat, which I need to address in a minute. So yeah, we have these little bits of Lisp um, episodes that I've been doing over a while. And this week I felt like doing another long form one, as last one's well, one went um, quite well. And what I'd like to do it on is uh, on the FFI that is commonly used in uh, Common Lisp for talking to C libraries and things like this. So we're going to have a bit of a dive into that today. We're going to kind of take it slow and fairly informally. As always, the source of truth is the manual. So please uh, do go and refer to that. Um, that's this guy up here. If you just search for CFI user manual, you'll find it. But I found it took me quite a while to get used to uh, some of the way things are worded in here. Um, as always, submit PRs if you've got better explanations for things. They're a very welcoming community by and large. Um, so yeah, let's, ha let's have a play around. Uh, first off though, Let's have a look. I'm going to get rid of that because that was me tinkering with some things. I will show you what uh, project we're going to be working with. I will put this online afterwards and then I will come and jump over to chat. So, um, other than a few things, a couple of strange files, like Emacs related files here. Um, we have a project just like normal called uh, CFFI Play. It's depending only on CFFI, and we're going to go into exactly what that is in a minute. And we'll see that in its package, we're using um, CL and CFFI. So we have common Lisp syntax and the uh, FFI stuff all imported into uh, the CFFI play package, which we'll be using today exclusively, I think. And so, yeah, there's this file CFFI play, and that's where we're going to tinker around in between that and the REPL. We've got everything we need. So. Uh, yeah, let's do chat stuff, then dive in, because I'll start rambling and I won't shut up for a while, as is my want. So, hello, Speaking Beast. Actually, yeah, let's see who's hanging around the chat today. Hello, Electrical Skateboard, Elevator Simulator, Infinisil, M. Fiano, and uh, Rahaldan. I'm not sure if I've seen you here before, if it's your first time, hello. And if not, sorry I didn't spot you. Uh, Speaking Beast, of course, good to see you too. Um... Okay, so Mfiano is saying, Hey, Baggers, how do you feel about Keppel losing Mac support soon? Well, I don't, because it's not. Um, yes, Apple have deprecated GL. That's, um, to be honest, that's been expected. Um, OpenGL is going, is currently, like, Vulkan is developing. GL is going to be defined on top of Vulkan, and thanks to the work of Kronos and Valve and uh, some other parties, the compatibility layer for Vulkan on top of Metal is has been opened and is continuing to be developed. So right now, I'm not having any major freakout. Um, that's that's kind of where I am. If that's what you're referring to, the uh, Apple OpenGL thing, um, I'm not majorly worried. They're going. They're not going to provide any more versions. That's fine. They're not going to support it. Fine. They weren't doing anything with it anyway. They've le left it for years, so it's not a massive change on anything other than intent. Um, Jewick Boot seventy two. Thanks for the follow. Um, so yeah, no major worries. I'll keep working on Keppel and keep it working on Mac as far as that's possible. Obviously, recently it's been difficult with. Uh, some of the bugs in um, SBCL and also, well, apparently it's not SBCL, is it? It's uh, it's MacOS bugs that only affect that implementation, and that's fine. Um, so yes, that, that's been a little tricky, also with me being very much not writing much Lisp recently because I've been, um, yeah, beavering away on other projects. None of things dead. Don't worry, I'm not leaving this. You can pry it from my cold, dead corpse. I like doing my Lisp stuff. But yeah, um, it's not the greatest time for <laughs> for Lispy graphics on Mac, for sure. But yeah, otherwise I'm not too worried. Um, 
And Enfiano says, uh, Stats has committed a fix for the Game Jam MacOS SBCL bug. I'm really interested in what that was. Um, I'm, I mean, very likely he's correct that it was a uh, MacOS thing. Uh, if you have any links for that, I would be very, very interested. I'm again sorry. I'm so out of the loop on this stuff at the moment. But yeah, let's uh, let's talk FFI. And again, heads up as normal. This is going to be very informal. Um, if you catch any mistakes I'm making, let me know, and uh, I'm happy to address them in future videos or pull this video down if it turns out to be crap or whatever. Um, so let's have a think. Um, an FFI. What's it for? FFI stands for Foreign Function Interface. It's a means of talking from one language uh, to another one. And the main reason this is done is for talking to things like C or some kind of lower level language. Um, and the reason we want to do that is that C has, there is so much stuff that has already been written, has been tested and is solid and is written in C. And it's easily obtainable through the various package managers that are available nowadays. So why recreate everything in Lisp if you don't have to? If something's already written, let's use it. It's just a computer. Let's treat code as code. And that's awesome. And so we have this means of doing it. Now, there is no FFI in the standard. It wasn't something they standardized. So what we have instead is a de facto standard. Many of the implementations made different mechanisms for talking out to uh, these different libraries. And CFI abstracts over all of them. Um, so you get what is effectively a, well, you get a common interface over all of the implementations that you would care to think of, uh, of common list. Allows you to talk to C and also D apparently, which I haven't touched at all. Um, so yeah, that's what, that's what we're going to be able to do. And also just to interact with unmanaged memory. And in fact, for the most of this episode, what we're going to be doing is playing with um, unmanaged memory and just, yeah. Just working with the stuff from the REPL, making little functions. Um, yeah, that's what we're going to do. What's happening in chat? Good things. Elevate simulates it. Is the stream a bit choppy or is it just me? I would love to know that. At the moment, everything's looking stable on my end. The um, OBS connection thing is saying I'm getting, you know, 3.5k up. Solid. Um... We have had internet issues here recently, again, uh, but that's been dealt with as of a couple of days ago, so I should be okay. But yeah, keep me posted if everyone's seeing that. Um... <laughs> Darius got auto modded because he was busy swearing. Hey, man. Good to see you, dude. Don't worry, we haven't, we've barely got started yet, so it's not a problem at all. Uh, Mviano links. Um... The git issue with the segmentation fault. So that's, uh, that is interesting. I will be looking at that later. Huh. Oh man, that, that's distractingly interesting. I will, I have to minimize that. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I really should be checking my um, GitHub issues more. But alas. Rahaldan, stream isn't choppy, but it seems that Twitch server have the troubles since yesterday. Oh, good to know. Thank you very much. Right, so let's get started. Um, we're going to be... Um, we, basically, let's jump back. We are very used to working with managed memory. Uh, when you work in languages like Lisp, or like Python, or anything like this, which has a garbage collector, you never have to worry about explicitly allocating an object and then having to explicitly free it when you're done with it. Um, and this allows us to not have to worry most of the time in a lot of cases about memory leaks and things like this. Um, we define some class def class foo and you know maybe give it some field bar and then we make an instance of it which is our allocation here. Well, it's not strictly, not strictly correct but we make an instance of it and then if we never use it again that's going to get garbage collected. So like we lose it now it's um, we're not able to reference it anymore the garbage collector is going to come along and say, hey, nobody's holding, nobody's stuck this in a variable. There's no references to this piece of memory. We can free this and it's gone. And so we don't have to worry about that. And that's all handled in the background by your garbage collector in the implementation. Um, so that's great. Now, that isn't how it does, obviously, in C. And so what we're going to be looking at is 
what is termed unmanaged memory. So memory that once you allocate it, it's gonna stay there until you free it. If you do not free it, um, then it remains. And if you forget to free it, you have what is called a memory leak. So you'll be allocating more and more things and you're not freeing it. Eventually you're gonna use up too much memory and your program will crash. Also, there's lots of dirty things that you can do inside this that are normally impossible unless all these protections are coming off, um, but it can be a lot of fun. Um, now, normally, if you're used to working in C-like languages, you'll be aware of the stack and the heap. So very loosely, the, the, it's just chunks of memory where you can allocate stuff. When you allocate things, it has to live somewhere in memory. Um, the stack is a is a memory kind of set aside as like a scratch space uh, for a particular thread. And so every time you call a function, um, your local variables, for example, will probably be put on the stack. And then when you return from that function, it's going to pop that stack like pop off the top of the stack and that memory is essentially uh, available again for other things to use um, the heap is just a big pool of memory so when you um, in a language like C++ when you use new you're probably allocating out of the, the heap there um, and it's a little less explicit in um, CFFI like in all of the implementations, you're able to allocate things on the heap. Some of them are able to allocate things on the stack, depending on the language, because you have things like um, ABCL, for example, which is a common list which compiles down to Java. Um, so there, which stack are we referring to? How is that handled? I, that's something I'm not going to kind of presume what their behavior is there. Um, I know that uh, working with SBCL, I've seen that certain chunks of memory have been allocated on, this, on the stack if they're of a certain size. But it's not super explicit, and it's generally healthy not to try and rely on that too much. Uh, but we, as with Lisp data, we can give it an indication of its lifespan, and it will then be um, stack allocated if possible. Um, <laughs> Enfiano is saying, yeah, I've got a billion issues for you sitting there uh, for your off time. Thank you. If like What I might actually do is do one of these episodes, uh, one of these weeks, uh, just working on Keppel. Uh, or Vario and things like that, because there are a lot of things to do. It's been actually really nice and active recently, which is kind of distressing of how little I've uh, I've worked on it. Okay, so let's look at some of the kind of the basic stuff. We want some memory. I'm just going to make a variable here, def var 10 of 0. Um, and then we are going to allocate some memory using foreign alloc. And we can see down in the mini buffer here, we've got a lot of different options. Uh, but the only required one um, is a type. So we're going to say we're going to allocate enough memory to hold an int. And what we've got back here is a pointer. So um, how this is represented um, textually is going to depend on your implementation. Um, what this stand this is SBCL which I'm using and SAP is system area pointer but this is a pointer to a certain point in memory so what we're going to do is we're just going to set temp zero to that so we've got temp zero and then we've got our pointer now we've allocated some memory but we haven't specified what's in it um, we've just got some space where we can store some data and there's nothing to actually guarantee that what you put in there is valid um, so let's let's just look for example let's go and read from that space and the way we do that is we do mem aref so it's kind of like looking up into an array and we're going to come back to that uh, why that is soon and we're just going to do mem aref uh, temp zero again we're going to say the type which is int so we're we're going to read from that memory treating is it, it as an int um, and that's going to let Lisp know what to convert the value back into. So when we do that, we can see that we've got zero in there at the moment. Now that might seem logical, um, but that is absolutely not guaranteed to be what is there. And we're going to see later that you could have any old garbage in that point in memory. Uh, we've just allocated some memory. There could have been something there before. There could be something not cleaned up. Um, you just don't know what's going to be there. So never rely on what that's actually going to be. Um, we can set the contents of that memory um, by saying setf uh, using memory ref. So again, lot, lot like using a ref normally. So we're going to set it to 10. And again, just a reminder that temp zero is a pointer. Um, so we're holding a reference, a, a, 
a value that points to where in memory um, that value is. And so let's do our mem a ref again. And then we, we query it back, we can see it's 10. So the very basic, we've created space for an int, we've stored a uh, value there and we are able to read it back. Now what is important is that in common less we're very um, kind of protected by the by the what is called the numerical tower, which is the um, the stack of different types we have representing numerics. And the fact that when you overflow one, um, Lisp has rules dictating on how it will be promoted. So if you have a number, say a thousand, and you store it in memory, you don't actually say what type of integer it is generally. Um, you're just storing, oh yeah, we've got 10. So we've got a thousand here or 10 or whatever. Um, and you raise it to a power. You know, we get a larger number and we can keep increasing this. And we don't hit any case where the number is too big. Um, what happens is if it can't fit, like it just, Alec, oh, sorry. Behind the scenes, it's representing it as a certain type. So let's have a look at 1,000. Let's just do type of 1,000. We can see that it's an integer between 0 and this large number here, which, I mean, it's pretty easy to guess, but let's just have a look anyway. This is a 62-bit integer. So I'm on a 64-bit machine. Um, I, I would expect that two bits of uh, the 64-bit um, chunk of memory that they're storing this um, integer in is being used for type information to tell Lisp what type of object this is. Um, so we get 62 bits left for representing the number. Now let's go and have a look at our rather large number here. If we do the type of that, uh, we have something slightly different. I was actually expecting to see a big num there. Oh, okay. I'm a little confused by that. Um, but we won't hang on it, but I will have to come back to that and find out what was going on there. But anyway, yeah. Normally we don't have to worry about um, how much memory the values we are manipulating are going to take up. It's just handled for us. And you can go to the hyperspec and see the rules for how that's handled. Um, in C-like languages, of, uh, um, it's slightly different. You have... Um, you have to explicitly allocate memory, and you're allocating memory of a certain size. So when before we were saying, um, oh well, let's have a look at a temp zero. When we allocated this, it was something like for an alloc int here. It needs to work at how much memory it's going to need to allocate to store that integer inside it. And so let's find out how much memory an int in this case will take up. So we've got foreign type size is a function that's available in CFFI. You give it a type name, or the name of a type rather, and you hit return, and you can see here that it's going to take up four bytes, which is going to be 32 bits. Now I'm just going to jump over to the chat because I saw some questions coming in. Um, Mfiano, does it overflow or bleed into adjacent memory? Yes, if you try and put something that's too big, uh, um, if you try and write a... 8-bit value into this 4-bit chunk of memory, it's going to overflow into surrounding memory. And you don't really know what's going to happen at that point. That's undefined behavior. You're, if, you're, if you're very lucky, it'll just crash. Um, but you might corrupt something else. It might be adjacent to other C data, other foreign memory, I should say, uh, in which case you might mess up one of those values. It might be even worse. You might mess up something that's uh, Lisp data. And then you really don't know what's going to have happened. So yes. These are the kind of things you have to manage yourself when you're dealing with this kind of environment. So we've allocated uh, four bytes and then we can store, yeah, these 32-bit integers, four-byte integers uh, in this chunk of memory. Now, there are a variety of uh, common types from C that are available in uh, CFFI. So we've already seen um, int, um, which is a signed integer. Um, I think you can also write it. Oh, no, it's just written like this. Let me actually check. Let's do foreign type size. Uh, no, there isn't a signed integer. It's just int. Um, and this is going to represent values both negative and positive. Um, 
So this would be roughly equivalent to in Lisp the um, the type sign byte thirty two. Um, we can also represent unsigned values if you use oops unsigned int. Then when it reads the value, um, this is this is going to allocate actually the same amount of memory. You can see that it's going to be four bytes. But when you use mem a ref and, and things like that and specify unsigned in, that's saying how it's going to interpret that value. So if you write something in, it's expecting it to be an unsigned integer. And when you pull it back, it's going to take that whatever's in memory and convert it back into Lisp as a unsigned int. Make sure you get those right. Otherwise, you're going to see rather strange results. Um, because again, like when you store something, it's just... You know, it's just just the ones and zeros in memory. It's what it. Um, it's just thirty-two bits of information. It's how it's interpreted that actually um, matters when you're dealing with these values. So let's have a look. So um, along with ints and unsigned ints, which can also be written uint, which is a bit tidier. I prefer this. Um, you can have longs, uh, which are in this case, eight bit, uh, sorry, eight byte or sixty-four bit uh, values. Um, again, like before, you have unsigned long. You have the wonderfully named long long from um, from C. Again, this is a sixty-four bit value. Long long and unsigned long long are not implemented, are not available for all implementations. The CFFI manual will tell you how to know if um, your implementation supports this. Most of the popular ones do. So, I mean, if you if you're supporting SPCL and um, CCL, you're supporting like eighty to ninety percent of the common Lisp ecosystem right there, and they both support long long as far as I know. Um, you also have shorts. This is another integer type, and it only takes up two bytes. So that's your sixteen bit integers. Um, and you also have char, which takes up a single byte. And we're going to come back to char and unsigned char. Uh, hey, the pinback, good to see you. Um, soon, when we get to strings. Uh, there's a couple of other types that you're going to see that are of interest. You're going to see pointers. And we talked about pointers already. Like it's a reference to that. Like so, so it's a value that's pointing to it. That oh man, words are just disappearing. From, from, uh, from me at the moment. It's a value that's saying where in memory something is. So it's a location in memory. Um, as we can see here, I, again, I'm on a 64-bit machine, so I have an 8-byte or 64-bit pointer. Uh, if you're on a 32-bit machine, expect this to be 4. Um, again, it's to do with uh, how much memory you can address. You'll also often see in uh, CFFI code things like this. Um, You'll see pointer and then int or pointer and some other type like char or short. Now, pointers are always going to be the same size. This is generally used as a form of documentation. It's just saying, hey, this is a pointer to a short or a pointer to an int or whatever. Um, see if I doesn't actually use that, I believe, at this point. Um, but it's considered good practice to write that out when you know what the type should be. Because, again, it's just more information. That's going to help you and others when they come back to this code. So yeah, we're going to deal with all of these guys um, in time. One of the other things that comes would come up very quickly um, if you're used to uh, Lisp is you might want to know how to define types. So there is a very simple way of defining types. We're going to look at structs and enums and things like this later. Uh, but the first thing is just a def c type. And this is almost like an alias. So um, what you can do is you can say... I have a type my int, and it's based on int. And when I compile this, um, then I can use our foreign type size stuff before um, on our new type my int, and we can see that it is uh, the same size as an integer. And by doing this, it's going to inherit um, the kind of it's going to be treated as a 32-bit integer. 
Um, and you, this will allow you, once you've defined this, you can use this as the type of arguments to functions and things like this. That's something we're also going to look at later. Um, but for now, I just wanted to play with allocating a few things and um, getting further there. Another thing we hit very quickly when we mess around with Lisp is arrays. We want to have collections of objects. Allocating enough memory for just one int is very strange. Um, so let's define another variable. Uh, temp1. Why not? Let's give it bad names. Set of temp1 to be alloc. Oh no, for an alloc. And again, we're going to... Uh, um, we're going to specify that we want to allocate integers, but this time we're going to use one of these keyword arguments down here. We're going to specify count. And so what this is saying is allocate enough memory to hold an array of integers. In C, your arrays are just a contiguous block of memory. So you have enough room for one int, followed by another int, followed by another int, followed by another int, subject to some, some rules, but this is what we're saying here. We want um, memory for 10 ints and it's all contiguous. So let's hit return and once again we have another pointer. Um, so this is to a different spot in memory. Just seeing if there was something we could see there but no let's let's not worry about that. It would be a bit hokey if we got that but okay so we've allocated some memory and now we're going to do something just like we did before. Um, let's do um, meme ref. This time our pointer is going to be temp1. Um, and our type is again is going to be int. And finally, we see this optional value down here, index, that's specifying which value. And so this is a bit more like um, a ref how we used to. We specify an index into an array. Um, so this is saying which value you want to pull back. And notice now that we're pulling these values back. There's some random data in there, shit that we never specified. And this is what I was talking about before, that you can't guarantee once you allocate memory, you're just being given that chunk of memory. There might be anything left over in there. Uh, this might be parts of a string. It might be parts of some binary executable. You just don't know. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, make a little loop. And we're just going to go through and set this. So loop for i... Uh, below 10 and then we're going to do and what are we going to do we're going to use setf mem a ref temp1 int and i and we're going to set it to i so we're basically setting the contents of our array just like we would with the normal lisp array to the value 0 um, through 9 so hopefully that's worked so now if we go and do our mem a ref 0 we can see we've got 0 in there one, two. In fact, just to show a bit of visual difference, let's store the value as i times 10. And now the first one should be zero, but then one should be 10, two should be 20, three should be 30, etc. So cool, we've allocated some memory. Um, we allocated enough for a single int. We allocated enough for 10 integers, all contiguous together in memory. Um, this is useful because there's a lot of code, like a lot of the C code you're going to run into is going to be taking um, arrays of values or uh, structures, which we're going to get to soon. Um, and so it's important to be able to work with these very basic things. It's actually quite a nice um, place to experiment with working with unmanaged memory um, because you have the REPL and because you can just screw around with some of this stuff. It can be... I don't know. I found it quite useful to have this. I, I didn't get into C until much later on in my life. It was not something I touched. I lived in happy little dynamic languages for a long time. So I, I started, um, my impetus for using C really was uh, OpenGL. And I was doing that through CFFI. So it's pretty recent, to be honest. Yeah, Elevate Simulator saying, on my machine, the array is zero initialized. And that's, yeah, that's going to be uh, implementation and, yeah, very undefined behavior. Um, you might be lucky, you might not. It depends on so many different things. So cool, we've got our little array. 
what should we do now? Well, let's look at um, one interesting little factor here. Let's see how will be the best way to do this. Let's uh, let's look at value one again. You can see it's ten. Now let's read it, but instead of um, reading it as an int, we're going to read it as a float. I actually forgot to mention the floats earlier. There are floats and doubles. Uh, let's just look at the type foreign type sizes of those as well, because it's informative to do so. So float you can see is a 32-bit float, a four-byte float, and double is going to be eight bytes. So it's your 64-bit floating point value. Um, these are going to be uh, C floats. So that's a standard seven was it 754 ie standard float um your common lisp implementation is not required to use that standard uh but a lot of them do so spcl ccl things like that i believe ccl definitely yeah no, ccl is using uh standard float as well so these conversions shouldn't be too expensive but yeah it, it's worth bearing in mind that at any of these points there might have to be conversions of the representation between Lisp and the foreign memory, uh, both to and from. And this overhead is important. So one of the advantages, one of the reasons as well as just feature set that we would uh, call out to see is that we might write something that we might take a chunk of our code and rewrite it in C and have it as a DLL because C is just really fast. If you'd like, if you, if you plan out your, if you profile and optimize well you can make some very fast code in C. You might want to use that and um, not have the overhead that you might have otherwise with a garbage collector and things on top of that. So understand that when you're calling out to this, you're calling a kind of across this boundary and there is some overhead. So when you're crossing a boundary, you want to kind of be doing enough work. You shouldn't be too anal about that, but um, it's worth thinking about if performance is very much something you're after. Barad, hello, sir. Good to see you. Um, so yes, floats. So let's take our memory here. This is our array of integers, and we're taking out the uh, yeah the first instead of the zeroth element, so the second value in the array. Um, but if we got it wrong, instead of int, we said float. You can see that we get a number back. It doesn't crash. It doesn't throw any warnings. Um, it interprets whatever it is in that memory as a float, and it might be an invalid float. You might get all kinds of problems, um, especially if you ha ha if you are trapping uh, floating point errors, which Lisps will do as, as standard. I think that the um, spec requires that. I'm not actually sure. I'll have to check that one up. Um, but yes, you can both set and. So let's set this to 1.23, right? And it works. And then you read it back as a float and it's 1.23 because we're allocating memory. It's up to us how we use it. Just because we allocated enough space for ints, 10 integers, doesn't mean that it has to be used for that. The system really doesn't care. Um, obviously this is a problem because now th this array was meant to be used for ints. Um, and if we read back what we expect to be an int there, we now get some garbage value. And so this is what some of the things you just have to be careful with. You have to know what your memory was allocated for. You have to know when you're going to free it. There's a lot more you have to do. So that's those first bits there. Let's have a look at this. Right, so that's a very light touch on um, arrays. And the next thing that comes up again very quickly in all C code is, uh, sorry, are structs. So let's have a look at those. Structs have to be defined. Um, and in Lisp, we would normally define them something like this. So the struct foo has um, a, which defaults to value one, and b, which defaults to value two. You might also specify their type. So you might say that this is a single float, um, and the type of this one is an integer. And I've typed it wrong. What have I done? Oh, I think because I've got some other things defined already from when I was playing around before and I called them foo. So let's call it tester zero. Yes, so that struct is available. 
And once we've defined the Lisp struct, we can go ahead and make an instance of it with make test to zero. Whoops. And again, we catch out mistakes from me rushing. We can see that the default value for A here is one, but we specify that the type must be a single float. So this is incorrect. So let's go and redefine that. Um, redefining structs is not guaranteed, is kind of undefined behavior in um, Lisp as well. So we are already in a messy kind of territory. Um, but here we are able to do it. And um, yes, we were able to make an instance of this struct. So that's structs in Lisp. We've seen those kind of things before. It is pretty simple, pretty simple and pretty similar to do the thing um, with CFFI. So make a struct that is um, compatible with C and D and things like this. So what we do instead is we write def C struct. We give it a name, so F test zero. So it can be our foreign test. And then we define some fields. Now it's a little different here. We can't define what the default values are. So what we have instead is we have the name of the slot and then we have the type. And the type is mandatory where it is optional up here. So we're gonna do float and int. Compile this and that's it. We already have a foreign struct defined. And if we go and look at our foreign type size, and we put in F test zero. Notice I'm quoting here because I'm using this. This is a symbol which names this struct. We're not trying to look up a variable here. We're just passing in the name of this thing saying, hey, give me the size for this type. And you'll see a couple of things. The first is that we got the size back and it says that it is eight bytes large, uh, which makes sense because we have two 32 bit slots here, an integer, which is 32 bits um, or rather four bytes. And a float, which is four bytes, 32-bit float, which add up to a total of eight bytes. And that's a 64-bit object that's going to be in memory. Now, I also got a note from um, CFFI itself saying, hey, this way of specifying a struct type like this is actually deprecated. Um, what you should be doing is specifying this. Um, and now we get don't get the warning. So it's saying, hey, the struct named this. And this is just how these types are written in CFFI. There's no, this is just the convention that they came up with. There's nothing fundamental about this that you need to understand other than just follow the rules. So that's what we've got there. Um, I'm just going to quickly define another foreign struct for pointing out something. Also, this is really dumb because I gave the slots the same name, which was stupid. Let me fix that. So we check F test, it is eight bytes, and F test one is 12 bytes. Now, earlier in that warning that we had, it said that you should use, please use pointer struct F test or struct F test, and we used uh, struct f test and that was fine now th these two are not the same thing this is saying if we did this this is saying please give me the size of the type pointer to a struct of f test and this is saying give me the size of um, uh, the struct f test so if i hit return here you can see we get eight bytes. And the reason for this is that's the size of a pointer. All the size, all the pointers um, on this machine are of the same size regardless of what type they're pointing to. That's just the size of a pointer. But this is important. Remember that this is the uh, type designator or type name uh, for a pointer to a struct of a certain type. And this is the type designator or type name for a struct of this type. Little bit to remember, but it's going to be okay. It's not too horrendous but again the things that we've seen before still apply which is kind of cool so let's go and do def var temp2 now and we're going to set f temp2 <coughs> to be foreign alloc and the type is going to be and I've got to remember to type it correctly this time struct f test 1 
So again, just like before, when we said foreign alloc int foreign alloc, like um, int with a certain count, we're using exactly the same function. Say, hey, give me enough space in memory on the heap um, to store one of these structs. And it's uh, you can see the one is actually an implicit is a default value down here on count. So it's almost like you're always allocating an array because arrays are just contiguous blocks of memory. So if you've just got one, that's how much you need to store a single value. And if you have enough for many, then that's an array. But it's one and the same thing. So let's allocate that. Now we have a pointer pointing to a piece of memory that is large enough to hold one of these. When we've defined, um, when we work with uh, classes and objects and things like this in Common Lisp, um, we have some uh, common functions to interact with them. Let's just do one of these now. So uh, we have a person, and they have a name, and they have an age, uh, something like this. And I'm going to give them some default values. So let's do this init form uh, name is the default name is going to be Jeff and the init form for age is going to be 10 I think that's correct yes and then we can do make instance of person we get a person and it's just um, def bar temp person and store this temp person this person also, I'll, I'll put this out as a reminder because I do this uh, in a lot of my streams. You should actually be uh, putting asterisks, asterisks um, at the start and end, earmuffs as we call them, around your um, global or special variables um, to indicate their nature. Um, I don't do that with some of my temps when I'm just working in the REPL, but that is generally a bad practice. Um, but it's very easy to type and it helps with just getting the flow when we're doing these streams. But yeah, we've got a temp person. And when we want to access one of those slots, we say slot value of temp person, and then we give the name of the slot. So in this case, name is Jeff, or we can access age. We can also set the age to be 50 and get it back again. And you can see that we've made the change to that object. And if I middle click on this, is it middle click? Or is it right click? Oh yeah, then you can do inspect. And you can see in the inspector, we have an object, um, an instance of person. This is its class. Uh, its age is 15, its name is Jeff. And that's it. Accessing uh, data from foreign struts is done in a very similar way to how we interact with these uh, slots inside a regular Lisp class. Um, it's a little more wordy, but we're but it's uh, not too bad. So that's how it looks. So let's go look at temp two again, which is our pointer to a chunk of memory that's big enough to hold one of these. And what we can do is we can say foreign slot value. So instead of slot value, we've got foreign slot value. We give it a pointer to the chunk of memory. Um, we say what type we are claiming uh, the value in the values in that. Um, chunk of memory are so in this case it's going to be a struct of f test and the slot name let's say a and we can see that we're getting a garbage value back we haven't set what um, is in that memory so naturally it is gibberish so just like with um, slot value we can do set f and we're going to do um, 10.5 for A, B is going to be 20, and C is going to be 30. And then when we access these, I'm just going to clear this again. You can see that we can get these values back. So this is us um, accessing values from a struct. Now this is a bit wordy. So it's not a particularly nice way of writing this down. So there is a helper macro called with foreign slots. 
And what you can do is you just open this, do A, B, C. You specify the pointer and the type. So, and I don't think we have to quote it in this case. I will find out in a minute. And then we're going to go print A, um, print B, print C. Yay. There we are. So rather than having to do this foreign slot value stuff every time, we have this macro that makes it a lot easier. Again, um, because we can see this is non-standard syntax from our episode last week, or the last week, the last time I did one of these, um, we, we can pretty easily guess that this is going to be a macro. And so if we use uh, control C enter or macro expand, we can go and see what this expands into which is exactly what we would have had to write anyway. These are expands to the, the uh, slot values using symbol macrolet. Um, so each of these is going to be replaced by this code here. And that just makes things a little easier to write. And again, it quoted the, the type name for you. And that's why we didn't have to quote it here. Again, these details are in the manual, but it's nice to go through and see them. Hey, Borrow Dust, good to see you, man. Right. So that's the very basics of working with um, structs. We need to be able to get values into them. We need to get values out of them. Again, like before, um, this is like when we, when we have a pointer, I know I keep saying it and I'll say it some more, um, it's just a pointer to a chunk of memory. It doesn't implicitly know what it's for or what's in it. You have to tell it. And if you tell it wrong, things will happen incorrectly. So if we do mem a ref temp2, and we say that this is a double, the first thing. Um, we can get a value back and it's incorrect. But it it isn't technically an error. It looked at 64 bytes. So it's looking at the data for this and this, and it's interpreting it as that memory as one double and converting that back in. And we got something that was uh, valid, but also garbage because it's not what we're meant to be storing that. Um, structs, again, kind of like the arrays, they are, um, now I'm going to I'm going to say this technically incorrectly. They are contiguous in memory, so the slots are stored A, B, C in memory. Um, when we look at the size of this, not pointer. When we look at the size of the struct, we saw it was twelve, um, which is four bytes, four bytes, four bytes gives us twelve bytes. So there's no, it, it's just enough room to fit these things. That is not always the case. You should look at the C rules for alignment. You can also specify things in here of how um, this is laid out in memory um, by using something called offset. Um, we might actually have a look at that actually, because it's kind of interesting. You can specify, for example, that the, um, the two slots are at exactly the same point in memory. And so reading from one or the other is actually going to be addressing the same place. And we'll, we'll tinker with that. Actually, let's do it now. So what normally happens is it looks at the size of this and goes, ah, it's 32 bits. Okay, this one will start at the 33rd bit and go onwards for another 32 bits and so on down here. Um, so it lays it out so things aren't overlapping. Um, but yes, you, like I say, you can mess with that um, by using a thing called offset. And so let's have a little look at that now. This is more curiosity until you're um, having to do kind of struct packing um, in different ways, or it might be something that um, is imposed on you by a C library. Because if there is a library and um, that you want to talk to, by defining a C struct that matches um, the struct in their code, then you're able to pass that over and you know that it's going to be compatible. I explained that kind of poorly, but so what we have here is we have another struct called blurp. Um, it has 
an int slot and then another int slot and then this int slot is going to be at offset zero which means it's going to be at the same place as a and then d is going to be placed after this one which means it's going to be at the same place as b don't know why you would want this but it can be done so if we go and let's uh def var uh was it temp blurp Burn alloc struct blurp. We've allocated one of those. Let's go and set its contents. So we're going to go set mem a ref. Uh, it's temp blurp. The type is. Um, oh, wait a second. This isn't quite right, is it? We want to set the foreign slot value of temp blurp. Two second two and the type is struct blurb because we've got to tell it the type and then the slot name is a and we're going to set it to 10 and then b we're going to set to 30. so now if we look at a and b a is 10, B is 30, exactly how we'd expect. But now let's go look at C. We see that C is 10 and D is 30. And if we set D to be 100, and then look at B again, we'll see that B is now 100. Because using offset allows us to place these in memory. You can also control alignment and other things. It's very important um, in some cases to be able to have this control. But again, you want to read up on it and try and understand that. And it's beyond the scope of what we can do on this little two-hour session here. But that is the very basics of struts. So we're specifying a layout of a chunk of memory, and then we're able to use some of these kind of helper functions like foreign slot value or with uh, foreign slots to access those things. Now, one little thing to point out is that so let's go have a look at our f test one again so f test one and we're going to look at slot a which is this guy up here um was it temp two yeah so we got 10.5 b was 20 c was 30. um because of how it's laid out in memory, we could also access that first element like this. Memaref temp float. There we go. And see, we get the 10.5 again. Uh, again, I'm just, I know, I know it's kind of repetitive. We're hammering this home. We've allocated enough memory at temp2 to store one of these guys. Um, there is a float and then an int and then an int contiguously in this case in memory so and the first element starts at the kind of zero byte the zero index of this chunk of memory that we allocated um, so by accessing it just in the way we would access a foreign float we're able to get that value back again we're not doing anything wrong here this is just one of the things that's allowed um, but again if you're working with structs try and keep it into the code in terms of structs because it's less confusing to your readers and you are one of your readers. Give it six months and you'll have no idea what you wrote. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Something we'll look at very quickly because they come up a lot in C, but they're not very interesting here, is that you can specify enums. Um, so test enum is going to have some keys. So we'll just say uh, Monday is zero and we'll have Monday, Tuesday, choose that. And we have our test enum here. Now an enum, um, 
is basically an array is a value that's representing one of these elements. So Monday is going to be stored as zero, Tuesday is one, Wednesday is two. This means this is a kind of integer type. Um, if we uh, look at its type size, if we look at its uh, size, so we'll look at foreign type size. We can see that this is a four byte uh, value by the default. So uh, when you specify these, by default, it's going to represent uh, this enum value that you're, you're storing in memory. It's going to um, represent it as an int. Um, but you can actually specify other types here. I'm actually going to bring up a couple of um, types that aren't as um, which I really like using when I'm doing a kind of numeric stuff in CFFI and it's the sized ints type, the explicitly sized because char and short and int and long are all integer types, right? Um, we also have uh, uchar and uchort and uint and ulong or something like this are unsigned it's the full name. Uh, but these are all different kinds of integers. Um, alternate type names for this that work in CFI are int8, which is an 8-bit integer, uh, which is the same as char. So that's one byte. uint8, uint, sorry, int16, uint16, int32, uint32, int64, uint64. I just personally find like so much of the time I'm having to be explicit about sizes or I care about the sizes. Um, so I find using these names is just much nicer. Um, it allows me to reason about things a lot easier when I'm looking at it in code. Like foreign, foreign function code doing CFFI stuff is um, it's really cool that we can do it, but it does get messy. You end up with very wordy code compared to how you would normally write Lisp. So, because you have to specify types everywhere and all this stuff and um, yeah, it gets kind of messy. So anything you can do to help yourself is worth doing. So up here, um, what we've essentially got is an int32. Um, and that's why when we get the foreign type size, we can see it's four bits, uh, sorry, four bytes are being used to represent it. Um, but seeing as we only have three values, we don't really need to use all that memory. So we could say int eight. And uh, then when we check the size, we can see that it's now a uh, one byte uh, that's gonna be used to represent this enum. Again, there's not so much exciting we can do with enums. Um, I suppose it's actually worth uh, quickly looking at one thing. Now. Let's. Um, Let's allocate uh, test, whoops, let's type test enum. And we'll just allocate an array of 10 of those. And it doesn't need to be an array, but let's look at temp enums, which is our pointer, naturally. And we are going to set, uh, so mem, aref, uh, the pointer is temp enums, the type is test enum, and we're gonna set, oh yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna just set the fifth one. For no particular reason, I'm just picking that as an example because we haven't used that number yet. And this is an array, so we may as well use something in there. Um, I'm gonna set it to Monday. Now notice that even though this is, like we're saying, an integer type, I passed in a keyword. And what will happen is Lisp will automatically convert this into the numeric version and it will also convert it back. So if we look at that point in memory, then a ref temp enums test enum five, we'll see that it gives back Monday. Um, but if you were to change this type and say that it was an um, int eight, uh, you will see that the value in there is actually zero, which maps to Monday. So again, this is um, roughly what we've been saying, but it's just value stuck in memory. Elevator Simulator says, can you have enums with multiple types? Um, the same enum can't have multiple types because it's just a, 
is being represented by one value. So you could have different enums with different types, and that's fine. And uh, yeah, I think that's all I know to say about that. Right. What other little bits should we get into before I get into actually the libraries themselves? Um, oh yeah, let's uh, let's look at a couple of other things. So, oh yeah, one thing that we we've been doing all this allocation, we haven't been freeing anything. So, um, temp enums, we've got a pointer here. When we're done with it, we must remember to free it. Notice that down here it only takes a pointer. It doesn't need to know its type or its size or anything like this because that doesn't actually matter. The operating system is going to keep track of how large the block of memory was and it will free that whole thing. You can only free the pointer to the beginning of that allocated block, not somewhere inside it. Try and do that and you will get nasty crashes. Again, just in general, all of this code that we're doing is going to crash way harder and with way less information than you will, you will get in a you'll get in um, Lisp in general. And so yes, we call free, it returns nil. This memory, I mean, when we look at temp enums, we've still got that pointer, but it's now pointing to memory that has been freed. We don't know what is there anymore and it's undefined behavior to try and access it. That's a bad idea. Um, this memory might have been given to something else now. It might have been given to another part of your program. So do not just try and use it. Like once it's free, it's free. It's not yours anymore. And we've already uh, leaked some um, some memory because I've got, well I've I've got references back here like oh, temp person. I'm not sure of the other temps we had temp blurp, for example. We've still got this pointer knocking around, but do we, are we ever going to use it again? Probably not, so we can actually just free it. So let's uh, borrow and free. Let's free that as well. That's done. And so that memory has been given back to your operating system, given back to your program, and can be used again. Man, my voice is drying out pretty fast. Okay, let's have a little more of a play. Questions coming in, just have a quick quick look. A bit similar to was the multiple types one. Barrett is saying casts. You don't have um it's kind of weird because in, in like C you can have casts of types, so you could say you could cast from int to float, and it will do a conversion on that cast. We don't really have that. We have there's a chunk of memory and you say what type it is and it's going to be interpreted as that type uh, when you write or read from it. But that's a, uh, I'm not sure what the correct term for that is, like a bit level cast. I mean, like, there is there is a term and it's just fucked off out of my head and I can't remember it. Um, oh, Elevate Simulator. I think I meant unions actually. Yes, we do have unions. Um, uh, with uh, type punning and stuff like this. Yes, that is completely av that is available and it is in here somewhere. Where is it? Def uh, C union. There we go. Defines a C union type. Boom! I haven't used these so much. So I'm, again, it's written very much like the structs, but I'm not so confident here. So I generally uh, not going in them into them today. Oh, one other thing about structs, while I remember, oh, now that I remember, is that they can also um, be arrays. So you can say that, say the first element here, do you do it with count? This is actually, now I'm, now I'm forgetting it. I'm just gonna jump the definition and, da, 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 and try and read this. Um, fields. Oh, I should just look at the documentation. One second. Def C struct. Yes, we can specify a count in the slot value as well as offset. 
So we can say that the first element of this struct is an array of five floats. And now when we do foreign alloc, oh actually we'll just do foreign type size because what we're really interested in here is uh, what we've just done to that type. Again, warning that I'm writing the name incorrectly, so let me go back and write that properly. Struct. We can see that it now takes up 28 bytes. So there's um, five floats, which are both, which are all like uh, 32 bits, so four bytes in size. Um, so that's your, that's 28 your bytes. And uh, so five, is that five times? Um, four is 20 and then you've got an int which is four bytes and another uh, int which is four bytes which adds up to give you your 28 bytes as before uh, arrays are just a block of contiguous values so five of these is just the same as having um, five different slots all of them with a type float so size wise and this is really janky, so like, uh, I'm, I'm almost tentative to do this, but but yeah, like something, something like this. Memory-wise, in this particular case, these will be very similar um, to this. Not with all values, though, due to alignment rules, which I recommend you go and read up on. Because it's kind of interesting stuff. It will be important when you're interfacing with these C libraries that are very interesting. Okay, so yeah, we've skirted around this for long enough. So let's get to um, actually talking to another library, talking to a library in C. And to do that, we have to define um, to uh, CFFI what that library is and where to find it. There are default platform dependent locations where um, a C program, or, or in this case, Lisp, is going to search for libraries, whether they be uh, SO files, as in they normally are on Unix, whether they be um, Mac um, frameworks uh, or dilibs, um, whether they be Windows DLLs, all of these kind of things. We need to specify their name. So they're going to search in specific locations for that. You can also... Um, uh, there is also a list now. I'm just trying to remember what it was called. Yeah, foreign library uh, directories. You can put additional paths in there, and they will also be searched for libraries. Um, bit kludgy, but works. So what we're doing here is we're specifying names. So we're saying if we're on a Unix platform, and in this case, this is like a case statement where the values here are things that are expected to be in the features list. So if we look here, um, Unix is in this list. And so this line will apply. And so it's saying, hey, the library is either called uh, libsoil.so or libsoil.so.1. Now, if we just go and search on my machine, if we go locate libsoil, we can see here that the library is in user lib libsoil so one So this is the one that's going to apply, but different Linux or Unix implementations might have different namings. So generally what happens is a selection of names are put here and one of them is going to be valid. And there's also a default down here. Um, you would normally have a Unix and a Windows and an OSX field or whatever platforms you're supporting with whatever the appropriate names are. Once this is defined, which we've done, you can use the foreign library. And when this is run, this is, this is uh, the top level form that will go and load that library. So if I just do libsoil now, come on, fool. What did I do wrong? I've got something here. Huh. Oh, yes, I know what I've done. You don't need to quote this. There we are. Right, so now what just happened is that it went and found this um, dynamic library. It loaded it, and it's now available for us to use. We have loaded a C library into 
dynamically into our running Lisp image, and we can now call its functions. Um, the reason I've kind of left a lot of this stuff quite late in this um, episode is because a lot of the time what we actually prefer to do is use one of the excellent tools that already exist to generate all this code for us, generate all the def C structs, generate all the uh, functions. And then we use those. So just for an example, let me uh, jump out of this. If we go and look at something like... Um, do, 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 do. What's a good... It's a thing, a lot of these ones now... Raw bindings Newton. If I look at spec, and in here there'll be a Lisp file somewhere. Okay, so what happens is I run a program um, that's packaged along with, with. Okay, so there's a an additional library along with CFFI called CFFI hyphen C two FFI, and it uses um, an excellent library to read C header files for a library. It reads through their header files and goes and finds all the definitions for all the functions, all the structs, all those kinds of things, and dumps it all out as JSON, right? So we've got all this JSON here. And then there's a wonderful C library that will read all that stuff in and produce this. And so you can see struct definitions as we go further down, there's lots of structs here, C types. And then we get down to function definitions, which we're going to look at in a minute. And all of these were generated for me, and I can regenerate them at any time. There's also the most popular tool for doing this is called um, Auto Wrap. There's also slight variants. Uh, Borrow Dust um, maintains one of those, which is fantastic. There's subtle details for why you might choose one or the other. Um, but they're phenomenal tools, and they're really, really quite impressive, and they use macros to such a wonderful extent. Um, the FFI and Lisp is one of the places that really, in my mind, shows how some of this stuff, uh, like macros, can really shine. Um, so when, especially compiler macros, so I'm just going to expand this, I'm just going to see what code we get. Um, so this mem a ref, it does something kind of cool actually, which we didn't really touch on. It allows us to specify the index, and then it's going to you like it's going to look at the correct point in memory by looking compare like by using the size of this type. So the pointer to the fifth element in this block of memory is whatever this pointer is plus five times the size of this type. Um, and one of the other ways we could write this, so I'll just do this, is uh, you can use memref instead of memaref. And here you do the, you have the pointer and whatever the type is, type e numbers or something like this. Um, but then instead of an index, you specify an offset and you specify that in bytes. So in this case, what was it? This was a single byte, so five single bytes would be five. So it actually works out the same. Bad example, Chris, bad example. But anyway, yes, um, if it was a 32-bit number that was representing this enum, um, that'd be four bytes, so it would be the 20th byte in, would be the fifth element in the array. So yeah, memref is a kind of a lower level interface, but this um, stuff expands into stuff in the background and we, I can just keep expanding this and whoops it's not going to let me go much further here let's see if I can do slime macro expand or oh it doesn't want to do it okay what generally happens and you can see in some places of your code is that um, the macros expand they take because we've statically defined the types here it's able to calculate all the offsets and size information at compile time. Um, these CFFI functions then expand into the implementation specific function calls. And you end up with these really nice calls which basically just say, get me the float at the fifth byte or something like this. Um, and so there's very, 
in the good case, you end up with very little indirection to get this call, or as little as possible in, in a um, in a high level language, which I think is really nice. So it's just macros being cool. Um, Barrett says, "Can I has a Lisp x64 assembler?" Uh, yeah, use your implementation. Use SBCL and use their uh, assembler. I guess it's pretty cool. You can. Um, I did some tests a little while ago generating uh, SIMD instruction calls and using that for nice fast data processing stuff. It's a uh, research into an ongoing project. But yeah, that's really cool. Um, not not for this episode, but once once I learn that one day, one day when I understand that stuff, I will. Uh, I'd love to do an episode on that. Okay, so now we've got this library, we want to call something from it. So we just define this down here, and I didn't actually go into what soil is. That was bad of me. Soil is a C library for working with images, which is awesome because we need to do this all the time, and loading, especially these these common image formats. I want this to be as fast as possible. In my game, I don't give a shit what language is being used to load some data. Like, I need it done now. I need it done correctly, and I need it done fast, because I have a game. <laughs> I've got to load all the assets so people can play the game. Anytime they're sitting waiting for loading is garbage. So, this is a really nice place to use a C library. Um, and now we've got it loaded, we need to be able to call it. So we are going to use now, where's the documentation? I would like um, load, oops. So this is kind of examples. So let's have a look. Now we can just go find the code for this. Oh yeah, that was actually it, but I've uh, we'll save that. Let's just go and see if it's on GitHub because it'd be easier to, to look at. GitHub um, soil. So I want to load an image, just a really simple Load image. Perfect. Here we go. So this is a function that is going to return a uh, pointer to bytes, essentially. Um, it's a function that... So this, this, this really is just pointer. We're going to return this as pointer. Um, it takes a pointer to a string, which we'll look at soon, a file name, um, or a file path, really. It's going to take an um, a pointer to an int. It's going to take, what's it going to take? Three pointers to ints. And these are values that are going to be filled in by this function call. So it's going to return uh, the pointer to the memory, to the, yeah, to the memory where the image is now. Ugh, that's the least English. Okay, so it's going to load the image from disk into memory. It's going to return the pointer to that um, to that memory. It's also going to fill in these um, with the width, height, and the number of channels. It also has force channels here, which is interesting. What's that for? Not so sure. What I'm going to do just over here, where you can't see. I'm just going to pull up some example code from earlier, seal soil, because I maintain uh, the bindings for this library. So yeah, let's work with this. If force channels was other than soil load auto, so let's go and look at soil load auto. Hey, look at this, there's an enum. So we're gonna want this enum as well. So let's just copy this and we're gonna make bindings for this one function. Right. So we have an enum, 
Oops. And load image. This is the function I want to wrap. And we're going to see if we can call this. Holy moly. Right. Okay. So let's use some of our skills that we've acquired so far, and then we'll look at uh, defining um, wrapping a function, which we haven't done yet. So if we do def c enum, which we looked at before, um, we're going to call it load options or something like this. Doesn't matter what it's called really. And then we're going to specify its values. So we're going to have um, load auto. In fact, let's do this a bit more. Let's do this a bit more lazy way. Okay. Let's get rid of this soil at the beginning because they're all the same. So let's just do load. In fact, all the loads are the same as well. Let's just call it auto L L A. That's cool. We don't need uh, these equals here. And we don't need those commas. Just remove those. Um, and then we're just going to wrap lists around those and lowercase them. Cool. So that's our enum defined now. This is the Lispy names for our enum values, and these are the int values that they match up to. We've made it the same as the enum in the C code. So this, as long as the sizes are right, which we're going by default, so they're going to be, um, these two will map perfectly. So we've got that bit. Now we've got to do the function. And the way we do this is in another nice uh, thing, just like all the def c structs and def c enums we've done is def c fun. So normally we're at defun, now we're doing def c fun. And what we do is we specify the function name. So in this case, it's soil load image. That's the c name for this function. Um, we're going to give it a more lispy name. So soil load image. And then we have to specify the return type. Now the return type is going to be a pointer, which we could just write like this. But like I said before, we can just provide some additional kind of documentation to ourselves. So we're going to go unsigned char. That's the return type. And then finally, the body, we just specify the arguments one by one. So this, this thing takes a... Um, file name, um, which is a um, pointer to char. It takes width and height, whoops, and channels, which are all Um, pointers to int and then lastly we have force channels which is actually instead of int that they put here we're going to use load options which is our enum again this is an int type and it's by default it's a 32-bit int so it's going to match up with this uh, we're using this enum because that's what the documentation referred to. So even though the type is int um, in the code, they're talking about passing in these values. So this should be fine. Compile this, everything is fine. And now technically we can call um, this function, uh, but we're going to have to be able to populate all these values. So let's make a little helper called load image. We're going to want to take a file path. Um, And then we're going to want to return a pointer at the end. That's really what I... Actually, no, we're going to return a number of values, aren't we? We're going to return the uh, pointer. 
we're going to return a width, we're going to return a height, we're going to return channels. Actually, the other thing we need to specify here, optional, is this value here, force channels. And force channels, we're going to default to auto. Remember that values means that we're going to be returning multiple values. In this case, we're going to be returning four things. This is going to come along later, though. So what I'm going to do now, right now is delete it because I don't want it to distract my eye as I'm coding. So the first thing we've got to deal with are file paths. So let me just... Uh, just do a quick check for something over here. Now, I'm pretty sure, if I just look at CFFI, I don't think they have a path, oh, foreign library path name. No, that's something else, never mind. So we're gonna to want to be able to pass in a path, and then we're gonna to want to convert that to a string, and then we're gonna to want to pass that string here. So for those who haven't worked with C before, strings in C are, okay, the default type that is used for C is just, for strings in C is an array of characters. Um, but we'll notice a problem very quickly if we try and use them. Let's do def var um, temp sdr nil setf temp sdr um, burn alloc. We could say character and we could say a count of 20 of them. So we've got 20 characters. Now, once we've done that, we have a pointer, but there is no way to tell from this what size this string is. It's an array of characters, fine, um, which is very familiar to how it is in Lisp as well, because the type of, if we look at array P, which says if something is an array or not, um, and we do high, we see that it's true. Um, strings in Lisp are arrays of characters. Um, we can actually get the first character of this string and we'll see that's the character. But in Lisp, we always have access to the length of the string. But here we've just got a pointer to some memory. We don't know how long it is. So the way this is encoded in C, the standard convention, is that you store the characters and then you terminate with um, a character, the, the null terminator character, which is just character z um, with the char value zero. And so we'll look at that soon. There are helpers in CFFI for making strings, so I highly recommend using them. Um, so let's have a look for foreign string alloc. And here you can pass in, hi there. Actually, let's do let's do something shorter. We'll just do high, right? And we are going to call foreign free on whatever we've got in temp string at the moment because we don't need that anymore. And we're going to um, set f temp string to be this value here. Now let's go and access the values. So mem a ref, uh, the pointer is temp string, sure. The value is char, and we're gonna get the one in zero. Um, and we're getting back a number, which is expected. Char is an integer type. So we are going to use, is it char code? No. Code char, yes. So this is converting the ASCII value here back into a letter. So the first character is H. The second character is I, the third character is exclamation mark, and the fourth is null. So there's our null terminator character. And if we just don't convert that back to a char, you can see that the char value is zero. And that's how you indicate the end of a string. So the length of the string is always the length of the text plus one, and that extra one will be where your null terminator is. Um, Electromatter, what about Unicode issues? Um, 
Char, uh, sees Char as not the same as CL character. Yes, absolutely. That is correct. And I am not going into that one on, on this stream. Yeah, it's a, it's a problem. It really is. Um, I don't have good advice of how to handle that in the general case. I'm just going to do a simple one here and uh, assume that your um, paths are going to be kind of, uh, yes, easily convertible to these strings, which isn't great. A lot of the time um, we're going to be allocating something. We're going to have these helper functions like load image here. And we're going to allocate something here. So we're going to like let some like C string be uh, foreign. Whoops. String alloc uh, the file path, assuming that file path is a string. And then at the end of the function, we're going to end up going free or oh, foreign free C string. This is this is ugly. So that CFI ha CFI has some helpers for this. So you can say with foreign uh, string, uh, we're going to have path, and we're going to take the we actually call it C path. We're going to take the file path, and that's it. And that's all this is going to do is going to allocate the string here. I was going to free it at the end of the scope. Excuse me. And now we're in here. We want to call soil load image. And the first bit's easy. We're passing in a uh, the file uh, path, which we've got here, which is C path. But then we've got a few interesting ones. We've got pointers to integers. So what we really need to do is allocate um, some memory, enough memory to hold three integers, and then we want to pass those um, those uh, the pointers to that memory into here. Again, doing that and doing the freeze at the end would be tedious. Also, allocating it on the heap could potentially be slower. So what we can use is with foreign objects. And I'm just going to use with foreign object to start with because its signature is easier to read down here. So what you do is um, we specify uh, width, we specify its type, we can optionally specify count if it's an array, and that's it. So then width is going to be, we should really call this C width, because it's going to be um, a pointer to an integer that is going to get freed at the end of this scope. Now we don't want to do this three times, so we've got with foreign objects. Um, or we can just do this three times. So C width, C height, and channels. I'm going to call it C channels, even though it's not the prettiest thing. C height, C channels. And then the last argument was force channels. And because we're using an enum, because we've specified the type of this argument here um, is one of our foreign enum types, our C enum. It's going to automatically convert these keywords into uh, the integer that will then be passed along to C. So this should be enough, I think. Some details though. When we're going to need a couple of things actually, we're going to need an image to load. And yes, yeah, so let's have a look. Um, play with uh, so we normally have an image in here somewhere, don't we? Oh, that's not true. oh, I mean, we're not going to be able to see this thing anyway, so it really doesn't matter. But let's use this one. We are going to call load image with this path. And what we get back is a pointer. So what happened here is we got into this function, we took our Lisp string here, we converted it into a C string, we allocated some um, integers, we passed all of this stuff into this foreign function uh, definition that we've got here, and then it returned a pointer, without crashing, it returned a pointer to a piece of memory where that image has been loaded to. 
So that's now ready to use. And we would, um, like, what I end up doing most of the time is pushing that up to the GPU and then using it as a texture. Let's see what's going on here. Sorry about the uh, breathing problem here. Barrett saying, another semi new question. Is there a standard? It is in a uh, de facto uh, most commonly used CFI, as in CL to C source, mm, uh, preferably with type hint smart inference. Um, uh, to C source? No, there's no real standard. Um, yeah, common list. I mean, you can't. Common Lisp 2C, you would have to get an implementation that compiles to C, like so Electromatter saying ECL compiles to C, which is the closest thing you're going to get. Um, but even then, it's very, it's not going to be, it's not going to be the most C -E code. So it's more going to be, for code side of things, it might actually be worth looking at a more low level if you're stuck on using a Lisp like a, a more low level Lisp and then make sure that it's one that can expose uh, bindings like uh, yeah, export function signatures uh, in the C standard way so that you can call them from common Lisp. So you might be able to use something like Bone or something like this, um, Carp or any of the other interesting little low level Lisps that are coming out at the moment. As long as they can export in a kind of standard C fashion their functions, then they should be usable, which is awesome. That's how we're able to interface with C++ code as well. We just have to make sure it has a C export. Okay, so we have a success, but we are missing a few things. The original function actually returned values through these arguments. These are essentially out parameters. So we need to get those back. So what we're going to do is we're going to change this to values. So this is going to return the pointer. But once this has finished evaluating, these should be populated. So I'm just going to call uh, foreign free on this guy so that we're not leaking that memory and then we're going to do mem a ref c width int i'm just going to do this three times height channels have i actually done this right i think so one second let me just check the macro expansion here with foreign objects is with foreign pointer which is yeah, it's doing an allocation somewhere here. What's really nice about with foreign objects and implicitly with foreign string as well, because with foreign string, I believe, it expands to with foreign objects. There it is. Oh, no, sorry. I'm wrong. With foreign string alloc multiple value bind. Ooh, maybe it's not them. It'll depend on what the compiler thinks about this. But with foreign objects, um, these may well be allocated on the stack, depending on your implementation. And with um, SBCL, as long as it knows the types, it's very likely that these are going to be allocated on the stack, which is awesome. Oh, see what. Let's run our function again. And now we get some values back. We get the pointer to the image that has been loaded. We get the width and height, which are correct. And we get the number of channels, in this case three, so that's RGB. So this has no alpha channel. Um, and that's allowed because we specified auto. We could also, let's just uh, foreign free that. We could also use one of our arguments from up here. So let's say we wanted RGB A. I'm not sure how this is going to work, but um, let's try it anyway. Okay, so it, like we forced it to have uh, four channels. It still reported what the file actually had channel wise um, so you would have to look into the documentation of what that means when the channels here differs from the number that you've specified there um, it might simply be that the this specifies what the file had rather than what you specified because you already know that because you specified it so anyway that's it that is the very basics um, we didn't get height Barad, Baradust, sorry, you're completely correct. I'm a fucking idiot. C width, C height. Let's do this. It's the same anyway, because it is a square texture, but thank you for that catch. 
So this is the kind of long and winding road to um, to uh, calling C libraries, and actually, it's pretty fucking tiny when you when you come to think about it. Let's get rid of this for a second. Oops, shit. <laughs> okay, so we defined a foreign library. We specified where you can find this SO or DLL, or whatever it is for each different platform. We called use, which actually goes and loads that library in so we can start calling it. We specified an enum and a function that we needed, and then we made a nice lispy wrapper around it. Um, and then we're able to call it. We're able to call C code directly from Lisp and it's all done in a very kind of familiar, kind of friendly way. And in a way we can explore from the REPL, which is hugely powerful. Um, so much of the interesting stuff that we can do from Lisp um, is built on top of this stuff. So all of the bindings to um, CL Open GL are built on um, CFFI. Um, in turn, obviously, Keppel benefits from all that stuff. Our bindings for SDL2, our bindings that Borrow Dust has so fantastically done for nuclear and not for nuclear, sorry, for um, yeah, no, sorry, the nuclear UI library, I was correct, yes, that one, and also for the physics engine chipmunk that we looked at the other day, it's fucking awesome, it's just great, and so we use this stuff all the time. There's obviously a lot of other questions of shipping things and all that kind of uh, stuff as well. Different people have very different opinions on how that should be done. Um, so yeah, that's roughly what I wanted to get through today. Oh, no, there is a bit of bonus material we could do. Yeah. Hmm. Because, okay, so we've defined structs and all that kind of stuff, and we can set their values. Actually, look, let's look at the time. 22, I don't think... I think I'll do the, the, the other stuff. The So, what... Words. I wanted to do a section on type translators, um, which allows you to... Uh, yeah, define how a Lisp uh, type gets trans can get um, converted into a foreign type. Um, which can make some of your code really elegant. So I do this like in, uh, in Keppel with um, vectors. So a vector two or a vector three is just a um, Lisp um, sized array of single floats. And you can specify conversions so that when you pass that to um, foreign code, what it'll get converted into. And it, and there's a couple of ways of doing that. There's, a, there's the first just translation process which is great, but the dispatcher that happens at runtime, so that can be quite slow. But you can also hook into um, the compile time expansion me mechanisms built to CFFI, so your conversions can be inlined into the code. And that's really cool, but it's a bit more of an advanced topic. I think I'll leave that for today. But um, fire any questions off you have. We'll see what we can cover. And I'll have a little bit of coffee and ramble a little about um, libraries, I guess. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm getting some shouts from uh, for bonus material. Oh, okay, fuck it, let's just do it quickly. Right, fine. This might be a bit fast, so if, for those who are the kind of normal um, little bits of Lisp viewers, this is going to be done at a different pace, kind of like the end of the macros video. That's a bit too much in a short amount of time. Okay, so the general idea is that we have uh, some type. So in this case, I'm interested in doing a vector two. So defund v2 is um, a and b or whatever, and we'll do make array uh, dimensions of two. Um, the element type is a single float. Oops. Oh, it's going to be really slow if I can't fucking type. Let's. And then, yeah. Here's going to be the return set of of AR0 to be A. 
be. Right, so. B2, 1 and 2. That's incorrect. <laughs> okay, so we've got a function which is going to return a vector 2. Let's go and uh, just define a few things for it as well. Uh, to claim, what is it, F? This is where I'm going to start slipping up. Function single float, single float to uh, simple array, um, single float to. And this is for V2. Good. Right. And. Oh, yeah. Rusty coding. Okay, so we've got a nice, fast little function for uh, defining vectors. And we're going to define a foreign type for storing those. Let me just get across to my notes here. Really? Where are you, you fucker? Okay. DFC structs for our um, for our vec two. It's going to have two components: a, which is a float, and b, which is a float. And <clears throat> what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to. Have some array of um, vec twos and something like this, so vec two or v two or something like this, um, and we want to be able to set our list value directly into that memory. So we need to be able to convert from our vec two, which is a single float array of um, simple array of two single floats, uh, wherever that is. Here, yeah, we go. Um, into this foreign type v2 struct. And the way that we do that is we define translators. Now, when before we looked at uh, def c type, which allowed us to effectively define an alias to an existing type, so like my int um, is an int and all this kind of stuff, for this we need something a bit more advanced. So there's a feature called define foreign type, and you need to do this to be able to access the uh, type translators. So uh, v2 type in this case, um, it takes it has no super types and it has no slots. Now this is a is a wrapper over. Okay, so in the background in CFI, um, it represents all of the types as objects as classes and stuff like this. So you can define more. You can define more types and it will be represented behind the scenes with stuff like this. Um, but it isn't the type itself. This is the type we're interested in. Um, this is gonna be kind of its representation internally at part time. I, I can't, I don't know how to describe this one properly. So I'll leave that to documentation. But we've got no slots anyway. The only thing we do need to specify is the actual type, uh, which in this case is struct and it's our v2 struct. Um, and we want to be able to refer to this not as just v2 rather than v2 struct or v2 type. So we have simple parser is a v2. With that compiled, we can now start defining um, conversion functions for it. So we can do, and all of this is documented whoops, in, um, in the manual, but it's one of the areas I struggled a little with. Um, so I find it kind of interesting. And it's one of the few areas I've actually been able to contribute to CFFI as well by adding a bit more code. So we specify a method that at runtime can translate from um, foreign memory into list memory. It's a method that takes a pointer and it takes some type. The type is basically gonna be ignored, but we're not gonna worry about that. We're specializing on it so we can dispatch on it. Um, and this is gonna be the V2 type. 
So this is the, the type that represents our vector two behind the scenes, and we specialize on that. And then we can do something like make, or actually we can just do v2. Mem ARF um, pointer uh, float zero one. Okay, so now we've got a function that can translate from foreign uh, data into Lisp data. Uh, let's see if we can actually get that to work. So uh, def uh, temp uh, nine is going to be foreign. Why do I let you people make me do like have me do this right at the end? Foreign alloc uh, v two. Um, count is 10. Of course, so we got temp9, uh, which is some pointer. Uh, let's get the first element out of that. So we do mem aref, uh, the type is going to be v2 index 0. And we can see that we've got back now a Lisp um, array with two values in. Obviously, they're garbage because we haven't actually set what the um, that data is going to be. Note that we can't actually set this ourselves to Lisp data. So if I do v2.1.0, uh, 2.0, this is going to fail because we don't have a conversion going the other way. So translate into foreign memory is what we have to define next, which goes like this, def method translate into foreign memory. Um, this one takes a value first, kind of like a set f, and again, a type, which is going to be our v2 type, and it is going to take the pointer as well. So let's keep going. We've got eight minutes left for this. So seeing as we've got the value and we've got the pointer, we can do the reverse of this and just set them. So set, set f, set f, um, it's a ref value zero. Error value one. We don't have to return anything. This is being used purely for its side effect. So now we can do this, and that worked. And now we can access the value, and we're accessing foreign data with this type, just like it's like it's a value type, and we get these conversions done for us. However, this stuff is being done at runtime. If we just put a print in here, print hi, um, you can see when I access that hi is printed. That's kind of annoying because. We specify the type here, which we means Lisp knows the type, which means it should be able to, it would be cool rather if it could do this in compile time. That's what the next bit's for. We're going to um, define expand into foreign memory and expand from foreign, and these are macros essentially. Um, so expand from foreign takes a pointer and takes a type, which is our v2 type. And it has to return the code that does the same thing as this, essentially. So this is pretty much what we want. Um, pointer, in this case, is not going to be the actual pointer. It's going to be a symbol or something like that. It's, it's going to be something that we're injecting into our code here. So we're going to call v2. We're going to be extracting um, from v2 type. Yada yada yada. That should be uh, that should be fine. So now when I expand this, uh, you can see that instead of um, being a call to translate from foreign, I expand memref turns to memref turns to a direct call to v2, um, pulling these values out of temp nine. Um, yeah, which was the symbol holding the pointer. So that's cool. Um, the nice thing about this is it's inlined, which means if you've gone and done something like uh, declaim inline v2, um, then this function is going to be injected at the call site. Then it's going to be fully expand, and you get the memory allocation done right there. With that extra kind of information, um, your Lisp um, implementation can probably do a very good job of inlining a lot of that code and bringing it down to really tight assembly. We'll see that in a minute and see how it comes out. Um, the last part of it, just so we're complete, is def method expand into foreign memory. And this goes something like v2 type um, pointer 
and then we return. Uh, what are we going to do here? Yeah, we're just going to do the equivalent of the uh, translate. Actually, we don't need to do it with the problem. We can just use setf syntax like this. Um, <clears throat> and we're going to expand, oops, expand with pointer and with value. And now, um, when you do a setf to this point, this should expand into the setf code that we just specified as well. So you're effectively divining the macro that will inline this code. Um, so that's really dope. And um, this can be part of your arsenal for getting some uh, things done fairly quickly. Uh, let's have a look. Let's just... Um, I don't know if there's a way to demonstrate that this you get kind of tight code from this. Let's just let's just do something stupid. Um, takes some pointer and an index, and we're going to declare that the uh, the type is going to be a foreign pointer. This is the Lisp type for a CFFI pointer. It is pointer. Um, we're also going to declare type i to be a uh, unsigned by 32 or something, some index. Um, is that right? Variable name is not a symbol. Uh, oh yeah, whoops. Uh, we're then gonna go and do um, a ref on the pointer at i and uh, I don't know. Um, is the first element or something like this? I'm not really sure. What does this say? Could not be in line because its source code was not saved. Uh, where's that in line? Recompile that. Now it is. Okay, so let's just do a quick, uh, let's see what we get in here. Slime, this might actually be awful. Oh yeah, no, wait a second. Uh, define, optimize, b3, safety one, one and just go up here and do slime disassemble will we get anything of interest possibly not um, now nah, this is a bit noisy still with all the um, other stuff we have to do but we can see yeah there's some floats being moved around there in some of the SS registers but anyway we can do the thing we never, we must never do. Um, oh, fuck it, no, that's just a bad idea. Anyway, that was the last thing I was uh, kind of was going to cover in the other in another episode, which is that you can define um, conversion routines to and from um, Lisp and foreign types and that you can specify what effectively amounts to compiler macros to inline those conversions um, when types are known. It just allows you to hook into CFFI in a really cool way. Um, I use this extensively. Oh, one last thing. One last thing that's actually really dope. Uh, I fucking love this. Um, if you have a simple array, like, a, like the one that's produced by our VEC2, right? One of these guys. There is a thing called uh, with foreign. Uh, no, where is it? With um, is it vector, I think it is. Oh, come on, what are you? Ah, with pointer to vector data. This is great. Right. This macro is really cool. What it allows you to do is that. Um, your implementation might be able to pin an object from being garbage collected for a certain length of time. So what we're doing here, we're not doing any conversion um, here. We have got a vector, which is a Lisp vector, which is holding two floats, um, and we get a pointer to its memory that we can then pass to C functions. Uh, this gets around the whole having to convert to do the conversions backwards and forwards. 
um, and you can pass stuff directly on implementations that support it. Uh, I'm not sure what it expands to. Yeah, actually in uh, SVCL you can see with pinned objects, which means this is pinned in the GC so it won't get free. There's obviously going to be some degree of overhead um, there and it just makes sure um, at compile time that this, or it tries to ensure that this is a simple unboxed array, which are the only ones it can reliably get a pointer to. But again, if your vectors are stored as um, simple arrays, like we've been doing here, like RTG Math does, like Keppel does, um, you can benefit from this and it's just, and it it's a big benefit when it adds up. It's really cool. So again, that's also awesome. I highly recommend looking at, there's a, library called uh, I think it's called static vectors or something like this um, made by this very talented chap here um, this for some implementations allows you to get a vector which is backed by foreign memory so it's non garbage collected memory for, for a regular um, lisp vector you still have to allocate them you start to free them well, more importantly, you have to free them. Um, but they are, they, they, again, they get around some of the um, conversions in some nice ways. They're, they're really dope. Go have a look at them is what I'm saying. Uh, that's about it. I have slightly overrun, but I will check the questions. Let's see what's going on. Um, dun, 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 dun. Oof. Let's see what's going on. There's a lot of stuff. Um, oh, what's going on here? Oh, so this is the discussion earlier to do with... Um, wow. You guys are awesome. I love coming and seeing so much chat in here. You people are great. Um... Wicked. Right. Um, can you share stuff with C without a uh, conversion, by the way? AK Crown. That's a little bit of what we uh, saw here. It's really down to the implementation and how they store stuff. Some of the things are going to kind of just be passed through. Like if, like if a function has to be called with a float, and it's an IE754 float in C, and that's how your implementation stores it, then it can pass it over without any real... Um, Conversion, but what's nice about CFFI is it bridges across all these implementations. You get a reliable output, um, but obviously when you're dealing with performance, you need to, like, performance is meaningless if you're saying for all targets, pretty much. Un unless you're doing performance, like, uh, you're doing kind of um, algorithmic stuff and you're just trying to increase speed in a general way. But when you're really interested in, like, getting the most out of the machine, then you need to know what machine you're getting the most out of. I think this is probably one way of saying it. But yeah, implementation specific. It's cool. Um, can you share stuff with C? Oh yeah, such as individual con cells. So no, a con cell wouldn't have a, necessarily have a mapping on the other side. You mean you could convert them in some way to something that C would understand, but it's still C on the other end. And we're bound by the CABI, which is, I mean, in itself, very cool. Um, it's nice that this stuff is standardized to a degree. Uh, interaction with C and GC. Oh, yeah, someone's asking about garbage collection. Yeah, garbage collection. And I would say there are wrappers that provide um, garbage collection over foreign data. I think it's generally a bad idea. I don't like it. Um, and on the whole, I'd just say avoid that. There's some libraries that do do it, and they do it sensibly, but it's so easy to get a pointer to something, and Lisp's GC cannot know about that pointer from the C side or even from the Lisp side. Um, it's just unprotected. You ca you can't do that in a really reliable way. You just you just have to hope. Um, Barrett mentioned Arc. Yeah, that's one way of doing kind of it's a kind of reference county GC. I've got a lovely GC book around here. I can't wait to dig through. One day. AK Cram, another completely random question. I'd heard about the term hash consing. Is that still used in CLM implementations? Um, I actually don't know what that is. Unless I know it as another name.
hash counting. Let's just have a look at what this is. Um, this is a technique used to share values that are structurally equal. Um, yeah, I don't actually, off the top of my head, I couldn't say anything concrete about that, so I'll have to skip that for now. But we can have a look at that another day. Barrage chatting about compilers, which is a great thing to chat about. Keep that up. Captain Craft is raiding. I have no idea what that means, but hello. Oh, I'm being hosted. Oh, that's cool. AK Kram's talking about using this stuff as um, a cache. Yeah, there's some, like, there's a project I'm kind of working on gradually. I'm writing a spec for over the next year, and then I'll try and do it. It's for speedy data processing in Lisp for game kind of stuff. But again, your, your CPU doesn't give a shit about what language you write in. It, it cares about data. It cares about the layout of data in memory, and it cares about the layout of the data that does things. Data that means things, data that does things. Data that does things is code. Um, and so to the degree to which you can control the layout of your assembly matters to a certain at a certain level of performance stuff. Um, with Lisp in the standard, there's not very concrete ways of doing that. Uh, with particular implementations, there may or may not be, um, say, SBCL allowing you to hook into the assembler and st well, look into, yeah. In, in, into the IR in certain ways and stuff like this. You can generate code there, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, there's there's lots of there's lots of really interesting possibilities when you move away from the spec a bit, but obviously then you're making things architecture specific and all that kind of stuff. But that's still cool. But yeah, like controlling the layout of your data and memory if your operations across those can be done in certain ways that you're not that you're keeping data locality good and stuff like this there's, oh, there's some really fun stuff man really fun stuff and some benefits you can get like measurable benefits captain craft saying learning lisp has been on my to-do list for years well do it it's really cool man i know the feeling though i've had like erlang has been on my list for years and I've just started that recently, and I'm currently like, it's fun because I'm running like full steam into a language, but I'm also hitting walls at full steam, which is kind of like, Ugh. I had one of those days today where I just, I thought I was making loads of progress, but just, I, I hit some pretty brick walls. Um, dum 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 dum. Let's go down. This nail never fails to amaze me. It's dope. Um. Borodust is saying, be careful not to dump static vectors into images. Very true. This stuff <laughs> is not saved. Um, yeah, be careful. Also, yeah, we, we should actually do an episode one day on uh, making executables, like proper binary executables from Lisp, and some of the uh, caveats that you hit with uh, foreign libraries as well. All completely manageable, but they're a little unusual at first. Um, Barrett's asking which GC book I can't remember I can't remember uh, <laughs> my head's a super at the moment um, but this is it I think we're done that's the end of the chat and that is me well over time thank you so much for hanging out I hope this was fun I hope this is understandable please especially for those who weren't watching live Please throw those comments in uh, down below. Questions especially. No question is too stupid um, <laughs> if it's vaguely on topic. Um, if you don't want to stick them in the YouTube comments, feel free to throw them in uh, comments over at Reddit or email me or hit me up on Twitter or something like that. I don't know how this fucking shit works. But anyway, I'm around. So uh, I'll be around another day too. Thanks so much for hanging around. Catch you later. Bye. Hit the button.